Hey, good morning. I want to thank you for joining me. And um, as usual, we kind of pre-record our message um, just prior to Sunday so that it's available anytime um, you wake up on Sunday mornings or anytime thereafter and we're able to edit it and provide the passages and the notes. And so it's a little different, but um, I think it serves the purpose and not quite like being here. Um, but nonetheless, you know, God's Word is always, um, always meaningful, and so it's good to study God's Word. Um, just one thing I would mention before we get into God's Word is just, if you hadn't heard yet, last week our um, pastor of student ministries, Dan Chapman, announced that he would be, after 10 years, serving as our, essentially our youth pastor here. His accepted position uh, with hospice, uh, going to be a chaplain for them, and so we're excited for Dan and his family, but they are going to be missed. And so on the last Sunday of the month, we will be having a special lunch fellowship for, um, in honor of um, the Chapman family and following the services. And on that day also, if um, you'd like to bring a, a card or of appreciation or even gift cards or anything like that, you're welcome to do so. And we will keep you posted um, as things unfold, and we appreciate your prayers and your patience during this time of transition. And so... Um, yeah, I've, I've, from the beginning, God said, love people well, but hold them loosely, and, um, and so that's what we're doing at this time. So um, hopping into our, continuing our series um, called Encounter, working our way through the book of Acts, which records the early stages of the, of the Christian church following the death and resurrection of Jesus, and the church is growing, but so is persecution, and, um, but um, in the midst of that, the, the passage we come to today, Saul slash Paul, um, kind of from here on moving forward, really takes, takes center stage um, in, the, in, the, in the growth and the movement of the church. And, um, and so the church is essentially at this point in the book of Acts, it's continuing to grow uh, numerically. Its influence is spreading into more and more regions. Um, but it's, it's worth noting that before the, um, even before uh, we had COVID and we had this pandemic that came along, Statistics show that 85% of churches were either plateaued or in decline. 85% of churches in America were either plateaued or in decline. So not trending um, a really good direction in, in our culture. And, and so I think I, uh, it's kind of why I love the book of Acts. I think there's a lot of merit of, of going back and seeing when the church was really flourishing, um, what were they doing? And I know that we can't go back and necessarily replicate the results um, there are all, all kinds of different reasons where that, why that might not be the case. But I do believe we can go back and kind of re-examine their priorities. Um, I think it's good to remind it of, of what it really means to be the church. And um, we have a saying around here that church is more than a worship service, as great as any worship service might be. And so, so that's what I want to do this morning as we look at this passage from Acts chapter 13. It's just look at what were the things the church was doing. You know, these are kind of a template for the things that should be priorities um, in our lives and in our church life as well. And so we begin in Acts chapter 13, verse 1. It says, Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. So I think one of the first things and the primary things that we find in this passage is that, that mission and ministry were a priority. Or ministry and mission were a priority in the early church and I just kind of want to make sure we're clear about what those words mean when we talk about ministry and mission. And the word ministry from Greek word actually means to serve. And so they were serving people. Um, the Greek word for mission actually means to send or to send out. And, and so the early church was serving and they were sending. And I think that's a great recipe for the church. That needs to be our mindset is we are people who serve and we are a people that send. Um, we we, we work on serving and building up the body of Christ, and at the same time, we're going out and trying to lead others into fellowship with Christ as well. You know, I want to look at just a few examples of, of, of what that looked like within this passage. First of all, in verse 1, it says, In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. So one of the ways that people were specifically serving is 
is through prophecy and through teaching. Um, there were all these new converts in Antioch. We read about that a couple weeks ago, that they had all these new converts in Antioch, and, and, but they needed a disciple. And so they called um, Barnabas, went and got Saul, and there were some others that came along as well. And, and so they were investing in the spiritual development of God's people. They were, uh, you had prophets who were speaking the word of God, and you had teachers who were teaching the word of God. And I think it's always important that we're, you know, it's not just one of those things where we accept Jesus as our Savior, and then we go back to business as usual. It's no, that we need to now um, kind of tune ourselves to listen to the voice of God. I, I remember we used to on our radios and everything, you would kind of tune things, you know, back before you had buttons that you'd push, and you tune it, and you just try and get it in the right place where you, you could hear, hear things most clearly. And you can be just, a, you know, a little off, and it didn't sound as good, but the, if you kept working at it, then you get you know, good reception. And I think that's kind of the way it is when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior and, and God, you know, uses the Holy Spirit to speak in our lives. Is sometimes it takes a little bit of adjustment to get to where you begin to recognize the voice of God because we don't hear that audibly. You know, and so God uses his word. He's always used scripture. He used it back then as well to speak in the life of God's people. And then also God raises up people, specific people, sometimes pastors or teachers or prophets that that are in tune with the voice of God and, 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 you know, speak forth what they believe God would have for his people. And so they were using their spiritual gifts um, to minister or to serve within the church body. Go a little bit further in verse 2 to 3, we see another thing. It says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they have fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Now, I don't know if you caught this. Who, who did that? Who did, did you notice who the Holy Spirit called to be set apart and sent off? He said specifically Barnabas and Saul. I mean, that, that's the A team of Antioch. I mean, that is significant. I got to believe, you know, if, if the early church was anything like the church of today, and I'm not sure they were quite the same, I got to believe that not everybody was excited about the idea of sending off Barnabas and Saul. I mean, they were the ones who led them to Christ. I mean, and, and then they're, they're the ones that were discipling them. Over the last year, they had been there and primarily responsible um, for the spiritual development of the, of the Christians there in Antioch. I mean, you could have taken about anybody else out of the church, and I don't know that, that the, the gap would have been felt as much. And so on some level, that was a major sacrifice. I think a lot of us in our churches, if we think about, you know, God taking, you know, the most significant and influential people out of our church, even for a good cause, we fill a little bit of, of the loss or the void because of that. You know, and, um, but our God is a mission-minded God. And I think we need to keep that in mind. He's a mission-minded God. He's always looking forward, and he's always looking outward. And we need to be a mission-minded people as well. As much as we focus on, on, on the building up of our church, you know, is God is, he, he's, got, he, he's got a bigger picture he sees, the, he sees the big picture. He's a mission-minded God. You know, we tend to, I think a lot of times, it's natural we focus on our church. You know, how's El Moro Church doing? You know, how's our church doing? And God isn't as nearly as concerned about, you know, in a church as much as the church. And, and so he moves people around. I, I mentioned love people well, but hold them loosely. You know, is that we're all, you know, supposed to, you know, just hold... Loosely, we love the people that he entrusts us with, but at the same time, you know, our, our hope and prayer is that God would raise up people and send them out. You know, I would love to have within our church body, God raise up people that feel called to go and do ministry or missions or other things and be a blessing to others. You know, I, I remember, um, I remember uh, some years ago, and, and my background a little bit, the first church I ever pastored was a church plant. And, um, and it wasn't birthed out of another church. We just went and started it, you know, kind of from scratch. But, but I heard a, um, a district superintendent once talk about, um, he used the phrase corporate san sanctification. He said, in our, in our churches, what we need is corporate sanctification. And we, when he went on to explain that, you know, we call people to, to die to self, you know, to be set apart for God's use. And we, we call individuals and families and people within our church to do that. But then when it comes to our churches, we have a hard time dying to ourselves, letting go or making sacrifices for something bigger and greater that God wants to do. We tend to hold on. And he said, we need a mindset, you know, that rather than it's always about self-preservation, 
we need to have a mindset of, of being set apart for God's use and, and this missional-minded people. And so they were serving, but they were also being sent out. They were doing ministry, but they were also very much on a mission. And the great thing about the early church is they weren't as concerned about, you know, about building a church as they were about reaching the world. As a result, they were on, on a mission to reach the world, and the church grew rapidly in a variety of different places. It was amazing to see the way the church spread out and reached people. You know, and, and I'm, I'm kind of convinced that if a church you know, is really filled with people who um, are committed to reaching people for Christ, you, you know, if, if that's really our focus, then the church will take care of itself. It will grow. Same time, if we, if we just kind of you know, huddle around and try and protect what we have, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that, that that's going to have longevity. You know, that's a recipe, is that we continually need to be reaching out and bringing people to Christ. It needs to be our mindset. You know, one more example of how the church was serving and serving, we see in verse 5, it says, John was with them as their helper. Now, you probably remember that that John right there is, is also referred to as Mark or John Mark. Um, it's interesting how many people in the book of Acts have multiple names, and we even see that in this passage. But that same Mark or, or you know, is John slash Mark, that's the same Mark that wrote the gospel according to Mark. You know, and... Um, and I think about, you know, this, this statement here, and it's, it's just one. John was w- with them as their helper. You know, so you have Barnabas and Saul, and they may have been all, doing all the talking, but John was incredibly valuable as a helper. You know, we don't know exactly what he was doing or how he was helping, but it's significant that that, that scripture even records that he was there helping. You know, and, and I think, I believe that the church needs people that are, it needs its prophets and teachers and and preachers and pastors and all those people, but it needs its helpers as well. People that are willing to do, just do whatever needs to be done, you know, for the sake of, you know, of Christ's cause. You know, and, and so, um, the, I, I love what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. It says, from him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself in, up in love as each part does its work. Did you catch that? The body grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Each part of the body has a very specific purpose. It's interesting, even with our body, even the, the, the most trivial of, of body parts serve a purpose. You know, we've got, we've got nose hair, you know, which is, as you get older, you, you do more trimming. I, I won't give you too much detail on that, but it serves a purpose. It, it's like a filter that keeps all the dust from getting in. We've got toenails. You know, you trim them every once in a while, but they're there for protection of, of some of the smaller bones on, you know, on the end of our toes. You have all these little parts, and, but if they weren't there, we, would, we wouldn't function as well. And, and when, when every part of the body, it says in this passage, when every part in, in the body is doing what it's called to do, that the church grows and builds itself up in love, and there's, there's an atmosphere of love. And that's when the church begins to flourish. But I think you can flip that around. Is that if you have members within the body of Christ that have chosen to be passive rather than to participate and rather than serving and ministering and, and doing mission, the church tends to be, you know, you, you talk about like your body, you know, if you don't use a muscle, atrophy sets in. You know, atrophy sets in, you know. And, and, uh, and, and the same is true in, within the body of Christ is that you know, if we don't use it, we lose it. We, we, we function better. The body is not nearly as healthy. The best the body can do, the church body can do, if people aren't participating and serving and investing, is, is just to kind of maintain. We definitely don't get stronger. And I think over the last couple of years, that's been challenging. You know, is, is in churches is that first we kind of turned inward and took care of ourselves, but then in the process there was this, Mindset of passivity that is kind of set in that's been challenging on some level. And as a result, you find many churches, you know, I talk to other pastors and just kind of, you know, trying to make sure you're not going backwards rather than you're going forward. And so it's hard to have the kind of growth and, and fruitfulness that the early church was do, having if God's people aren't also willing to serve. You know, so we have this example, great example in the early church, you know, is, is ministry and mission. Ministry and mission. Serving and sending. And I think if that's all the church did, man, serving and sending, serving and sending, serving and sending, you know, that'd be, that'd be a, a pretty exciting church, you know, a church that's on the move. 
Well, n- next thing that kind of stands out to me in this, um, this passage is that the church was incredibly diverse. The church was incredibly diverse. Now, I, I want to look at this in verse 1. It says, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, and it names, you know, five specific people. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. So as the Christian movement moved from Jerusalem to these other regions, the church became increasingly diverse, and that diversity was reflected even in its leadership. And, uh, you know, five specific men mentioned as prophets and teachers there in Antioch, and on the surface, they just seem like names to us. We don't know enough about the, we even read the cities or the areas, and it means nothing to us. But I want to go back and look at each of these five men. First of all, you have Barnabas. So he's a Levite from Cyprus. He was an Israelite. You had Simeon called Niger, which in Hebrew means black. And, and, um, and so we, we know from the geography that he came most likely from an area, you know, from the, an area within Africa. Um, and most scholars believe that, you know, it's probably a black person and, and believe that he may have specifically been that Simeon of Cyrene that carried the cross for Jesus on his way to be crucified. And then you go to the next person that's listed there, Lucius of Cyrene. He's from northern Africa, now eastern Libya. So likely another dark-skinned individual. The young Manan, who had been brought up with Herod, um, not the same Herod we read about last week, a different Herod, um, the Herod who had been um, responsible for the beheading of John and the trial of Jesus um, that led to his crucifixion. So he's brought in this house, you know, talking about two completely different, I don't know that they're brothers, some of them are more like foster brothers, you know, but brought up in the same home and they went completely different paths and one was, you know, persecuting the church and, and then you had this other one who was discipling the church. Uh, then you had Saul, you know, came from Tarsus and we know that he's a, he's a Jew but he was also raised in a Roman region and so he has this kind of blended background. And so this is one very eclectic group uh, uh, of leaders, of prophets and teachers. I mean, God was using them in amazing ways to bless the church there in Antioch. You know, I, Paul a- adopted this mindset, you know, and, and I like what he writes in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 to 28. He says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, he's not saying that we lose our individuality or our distinctiveness. Some people have even tried to use, there's neither male nor female to try and make a case for, you know, gender issues and things like that. And that's not what he's saying there. We don't lose our identity or dis, our distinctiveness. But, but there's this idea that within the body of Christ, the beauty of it is that we all stand on equal ground before God. And, and we need to function that way within the body of Christ, you know, a, an atmosphere of diversity and equality. You know, I was reading this week, it's interesting to think about diversity within the context of where we live. You know, this area, you know, from Los Osos and Morro Bay and Cayucas is predominantly the area that we minister to. And so I, did, I looked into it, you know, and I found this this week. Here's the racial makeup of Los Osos, um, where our church is located. 73% of the people in this area are white, 19% are Hispanic, 4% are Asian, and, and then you have Native American, African American, Pacific Islander, and others that are all less than 1%. So you look at those numbers and say if 73% are, are all, you know, all white, we don't live in the most ethnically diverse area. That being said, I would hope that anybody that attends our church would feel incredibly welcome here, just as welcome as anyone else. You know, and um, so what's the solution? Well, I, I mean, I think, I think from the beginning of, history shows us that any effort to try and manipulate or force diversity, it's, it's met with mixed results at best. You can go back to the 1950s, where they were already trying to do busing as a means to try and bring about integration in schools, and it was met with all kinds of mixed results. But I do believe this, and I think this is the point, is that when, when people have a genuine love of the Lord and they are filled with the Holy Spirit, then hearts become softened. I think barriers become broken. And people of all backgrounds feel welcome. And, 
and I would just add this, you know, that I believe that we have that type of church. You know, that anybody who comes in, you know, is, is, is welcome. We just see people and potential for somebody to know Christ and, and to be a brother or sister in the Lord. And, I, and so I think that's one of the, the beautiful things is as the church was growing, part of it is because it was branching out beyond, beyond Jerusalem. And it was ministering to people of all kinds of different backgrounds. You know, and, and God's desire is that all men be saved, that no one should be lost and should perish. And so, so we need to have that mindset as well, of just embracing people from all kinds of different backgrounds. The third thing I, I notice in this passage that stands out to me is that it's really clear that um, worship and prayer and fasting were essential holy habits of the church. Worship and prayer and fasting were vital holy habits of the early church. Look at verse 2 to 3. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Lord said, Set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. And we see this over and over and over in the book of Acts. Is they, they were committed to worship. They were committed to prayer. They were committed to fasting. You know, in which I, I actually think the time of this passage is great because, you know, tonight, tonight being Sunday night, we have um, Encounter, which we do every other month. You know, it's just a, a gathering for, for worship and, and prayer. Not even a lot of preaching or anything like that. Just to have an encounter with God. It says, draw close to God and he'll draw close to us. And that's really the goal of Encounter. You know, and, um, but I want to talk about each of these holy habits when we talk about worship and prayer and fasting. Um, just briefly, you know, worship. There's a lot of different words that are, that, that are translated for worship. And the one I like the best is worship means to kiss toward something to kiss towards something. It's, it's to express affection and adoration. So when we, another defin, and definition means to ascribe worth. And, and so when we worship God, we're not making up worth about God. We're verbalizing that we recognize the worth and the value of God. Um, and so we, you know, part of worship is, is in songs and things like that help us think about the value and, and the characteristics and everything that makes God God. And we we, we echo that back to God. And we express adoration. We kiss towards God. And what a great picture. And then we talk about, um, about prayer. And there's all kind of, we pray for all kinds of different reasons. But the type of prayer they were doing is just calling out to God. Just calling out to God. And, and um, I believe it wasn't just praying for, for the needs of individuals, although that was important. But also I believe it was, it was praying for the movement of the Holy Spirit in the early church and that people would come to Christ and I like what A.T. Pearson said. He said, there has never been a spiritual awakening in any country or locality that did not begin in united prayer. Say that again. There has never been a spiritual awakening in any country or locality that did not begin in united prayer. We need to pray and we need to pray together. And, and then fasting. You know, fasting isn't praying quickly or doing something fast. That's not it. Fasting, I think we understand, it. it's abstaining from something that's normally a part of our life, in order to increase our, our focus and intentionality, especially in the area of prayer. So as we take something out of our life that's normally part of our life, you know, and, and maybe even something that we value, in, in that absence, every time we think about it not being there, we, we, we recognize this, this void in our life, that our need uh, of God. And, and so we set aside things, you know, we, things that we value. You know, it can't be like, well, I don't like vegetables, so I'm going to fast vegetables. No, you think about the things that mean something to you. And, and it's not a way of trying to earn God's favor. That's not the point. It just makes us more intentional about our prayer lives and more receptive to what God wants to speak, in, speak into our life and more obedient to whatever that is he calls us to. And I think fasting is interesting because I think, I think the church of today, for the most part, um, really enjoys worshiping. I think that there are churches where sometimes people love, you know, worshiping more than they do, you know, the, the Word of God, you know, is that we, we love that. There's something about it that connects with us, but we love worship. We value prayer, especially when we're in crisis or need something. But fasting, I think, is interesting because even though fasting is mentioned at least 70 to, 77 times in Scripture, I think it's, it's probably often the, the forgotten or neglected holy habit and I understand why, because it's not as fun as some of the other things. Worship makes us feel good. Fasting makes me feel miserable sometimes, quite honestly. You know, I, I've done a lot of fasting, and I don't love it, especially with food. I'm one of those people that, 
every three hours, man, I get hungry or I get, you know, hangry, you know, and, and I just, want, and so it's, it's hard, you know, it's, it's a sacrifice, it's, it's uncomfortable, you know, it, it, it's, and so there's something about it, but I think there's also great value in that as well. You know, I mentioned fast a lot of different times in my life, and Scripture taught, you know, I mentioned 77 different times, you know, there's, there's even eight, at least eight specific occasions in, and that people, you know, for why people um, fast, and, um, and it's not always giving up the same thing. Sometimes it's food and variations and things like that, but a lot of different ways we can fast. I remember in San Diego, we were planning a church, and, and, um, but it was, it was challenging for us financially as a church, and it was challenging for us financially as a family. And, um, and so we were really spread thin there, you know, and not sure how we were going to make it. And it just felt, you know, like the Lord was calling me and Amy to, to make Wednesdays our day of prayer and fasting. Um, and, and it was always removing food, you know. In fact, for me, most of the time what I found on Wednesdays is, is I would just not do social media on that day, you know, unless it was work-related. And so when I'd get in the car, I wouldn't, I, and I wouldn't listen to music. I would just TV. I'd block all that stuff out on Wednesdays just to help me instead focus on God in those times. And did that for years, and then even went to, you know, our next church in, in Bakersfield and continued to do that. And, and it was amazing to see the way God seemed to move. And it's amazing how often he provided it specifically on Wednesdays as well. And as I was preparing this message this week, I felt challenged and convicted. I thought, you know, I don't know that I've been doing that as much as I used to or should. And so I'm kind of recommitting to that. And, and for me, I guess what I extend invitation is that I, I want to go back to setting aside Wednesdays as a, a day of prayer and fasting for for ourselves, for our family, for our, our church, and for our community. And I'm asking if you'll join me in that. And, and it doesn't necessarily need to be give up food for the whole day. Maybe you choose one meal. Maybe it's, it's, it's media or, you know, you're not going to look at Internet or, or whatever it is. Just choose something that would normally be part of your life and say, I'll set that aside. And on those days, I, I, we're going to pray for ourselves. We're going to pray for our family. We're going to pray for our church. We're going to pray for our community. And if you want to shoot me a text on that day, just as a way of encouraging you know, or, or I, I think that'd be awesome. And I'd love to see what the Lord does as we commit ourselves to prayer and to fasting and do it with it on a consistent basis. And so if that's something you're willing to do, I would love to know it, you know, and, and um, just as a means of encouragement. And so, so they were doing these things, and God was doing amazing things because of that. And it's interesting in this passage, it was actually while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting that the Holy Spirit spoke. And I think that's what happens. It's when we're worshiping God and when we're, in prayer and when we're fasting that, that the Holy Spirit most often speaks in our life and it's, it's when we are often most in tune with what God wants to speak in our life. It's, it's times where we're most receptive. It's times where we're most obedient. You know, I, I think God honors, it creates a, a window. Not that God can't speak in our, t- our life other times, but it's like we're more in tune and more receptive during those times. So I encourage you to think about what role those holy habits play in your life. I also, as I look at this passage we read this morning, is the church studied and shared the word of God. They studied and shared the word of God. Just, it's really interesting. Like, just like you know, serving in ministry was often functioning within the body of Christ, but they were also you know, sending people out to lead people to Christ. They were studying the word of God within the church settings and contexts. We read they had teachers there. They were being discipled. But also, I love this in verse 1. It says, when they arrived at Salamis... They proclaimed the word of God. When they arrived, they proclaimed the word of God. You know, I love that as soon as they arrived, they didn't waste any time. One of the first things they did is just when they saw anybody that would listen, they started to tell them what, about the word of God, telling people about Jesus, telling what the scriptures, you know, had to say. You know, anybody that would listen, you know, I, I love that the early church wasn't just studying the word of God. They were sharing the word of God. And I think that's significant. It's one thing to, to study or, or proclaim the word of God within these church walls. You know, to come on Sunday mornings and we talk about the word of God or be involved in these growth groups and small groups and do that. But I also believe that, that God's word needs to go out beyond these walls. You know, that we need to share the word of God with others. You know, and sometimes it's a word of encouragement to people. Other times it's a word of conviction or a reminder, you know, that... that that this is what the Word of God says, and I believe there's power and anointing, and we need to be careful about assuming that the world's not interested in what the Bible has to say. And I'm not saying that every person's interested or receptive, but God's Word is power. There's this, you know, significant 
um, anointing on it. In, in Isaiah chapter 5, 55, verse 11, it says that God's word goes out and it will not return void, but will accomplish what God desires and achieve the purpose for which he sent it. And once again, it doesn't guarantee that everybody's going to be receptive, but, but it doesn't return void. You know, and, and for that matter, people may not be receptive right then, but you know, if they keep hearing these things over and over and over, at some point, it begins to penetrate the heart and, be, and br- it begins to bring change and repentance in people's lives. You know, and I'm not saying that we should go around quoting scripture to everyone that we meet, and although I don't know that that would be the worst thing that we ever did, um, but we do need to study the word of God and we need to share the word of God. And so just two questions this morning, you know, when it comes to studying the word of God, what does that look like in your life? When it comes to studying the word of God, what does that look like? You know, and, and just three things that I hope that all of us, you know, have, have going on in our lives. One is, is corporate worship, you know, doing what we're doing right now, tuning in to listen to me or, or showing up for, for worship service is, is, is a great way to just consistently every week be exposed to the word of God and be processing it and chewing on it and meditating on it. The second is, is getting involved in a growth group. I believe that everybody should be involved in a growth group. Growing in a relationship with God and growing in a relationship with others, so significant. There's a level of, of processing and dialogue and even accountability and encouragement that happens in small groups that can't happen in our worship services. And we've got a number of different small groups meeting a lot of different times. If you don't like one, find another. You know, is it, that, that we need to be involved in a small group together. I believe that everybody within our church should be. And the third thing is we need to be studying the Word of God at home just on our own. You know, it, it's it just consistently, you know, is, is just opening up, you know, and, and I don't mean that we need to beat ourselves up if we miss a day here or there, and it's not just some kind of a spiritual checklist where I did this, I did that, or anything like that, and it doesn't mean you're good if you do and bad if you don't. That's not the point. But, but if we love the Lord, we should want to know what he has to say to us, you know, and um, David loved the Word of God. You know, and, and, you know, it's just so, makes, it makes me wiser than my enemies, and, 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 it, and it revives the soul, and it's just a, an incredible gift from God that we have. And there's people in other countries that don't have easy access to this, and they give anything to have what we have. And, um, and, and sometimes I don't know that we, we value it the way we could or should. The other question, you know, related to this point, though, is also when it comes to sharing the Word of God with others, what does that look like? When it comes to sharing the word of God, you know, and sometimes sharing the word of God within the body of Christ, that's great, but also outside the body of Christ. You know, my, my mom was great about just, you know, she used to, you know, get post-its and, and put it on a variety of different things. I'd, I, in my, in my um, lunch bag, she'd make lunch and there'd be verses in there. I'd go in my bathroom and there was post-it on the mirror, you know, just every time I turned around, she was speaking God's word into my life and it made a difference. You know, and, and I think we have opportunities sometimes, you just when something's going on, and, and just to be able to say, hey, you know, I, I got to tell you what I, what I you know, what, what God's word says about this. So I just encourage you, I don't know that it's always easy or it feels natural or whatever, but just be mindful of ways to speak God's word into people's lives. You know, to be able to tell them what the word of God says, and not in some kind of a thus saith the Lord leverage kind of way, but as a means of encouraging people and drawing them into, into, into fellowship with Christ. Well, let's continue with our reading in Acts chapter 13, verse 6 to 12. So they're going about, and they they arrived, and they're speaking the word of God, and it's interesting here. In verse 6, it says, They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. So he's two things. He's a sorcerer and a false prophet, and his name is Bar-Jesus, which we'll talk about a little bit. And he was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elamus, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elamus and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You're going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Well, immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. 
And if you don't know what a proconsul is, it's, it's like a governor of a certain area or region. So here's the last point this morning. The church had a Holy Spirit-induced boldness. The, the church had what I call a Holy Spirit-induced boldness. It was a boldness that didn't come from themselves. God, over and over in Scripture, we read God says, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous. And it's not something that we have in and of ourselves, but as we are, are, are filled with the Spirit and see situations from God's perspectives, we become emboldened by the Holy Spirit. So when Paul and Paul slash Saul, same person, um, so when Saul and Barnabas arrived at Paphos, they encounter a man named Bar-Jesus. And now the name Bar-Jesus actually means son of Jesus. You know, Jesus the Messiah isn't the only man named Jesus in those days. Um, but he's named um, son of Jesus. Um, my son's Dawson, which actually means son of David, which my name's not David, but anyways, he's named, his name means son of Jesus. But since this man was a sorcerer and a false prophet, Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, he, he didn't want to refer to him as son of Jesus. He didn't feel like he was worthy of that name, that he deserved it. So instead, he refers to him by his other name, which is Elimus, which actually means magician or corrupter. He, he doesn't want to say, you're, you're, there's nothing about you that deserves the name son of Jesus. The more appropriate name is magician or sorcerer, because that is what you are. You know, from this perspective, this man didn't deserve to be called son of Jesus. And, and Saul, we see in this passage, felt the same way. You know, because rather than for, referring to the man as the son of Jesus, you know, he calls him a child of the devil. He says, you are a child of the devil. I think that's so awesome that he says, he, you go by the name son of Jesus, but the reality is you are the son of the devil. You know, and consider what this man was doing and how it could have been used to lead people astray. And how the same things that, that this man back then, Elimus, the sorcerer of false prophet, was doing, those are the same tools that, that the enemy uses to, to turn people away from God, to lead them astray, all the while think that, they, think that they're doing great. You know, and that's what a false prophet, it sends you down a path that seems good, but it's a path that leads to destruction. It says in Scripture, narrow is the path that leads to, to life. You know, wide is the path that leads to destruction. And that's what the false prophet was doing. It looks good on the surface. So first of all, he's a sorcerer. You know, this guy is a sorcerer. And, and, and we, you know, sometimes people in an effort to tap into power or, you know, the, the supernatural will go down all kinds of different paths. You know, occasionally it's as blatant as, as going down the path of the occult. You know, you know, what is following Satan because of the power they think is available, accessible, and then buy into that. But I don't think that's the case for more people. I think it's, it's more subtle in our, in, our, in our culture. You know, it's interesting. There's been a rise of Wicca, which is white magic in re recent years. And all of a sudden it sounds better because you call it white magic, but it's still, you know, of the devil. You know, or, or even more prevalent is the number of people who buy into using like crystals. To tap into the energy of the universe that is supposed to give us more power or bring healing in our life or bring more peace into our life or, or bring prosperity into our life. You know, we had even somebody at my last church that, that was, you know, making jewelry out of crystals and giving them to ladies in the church with the little descriptions of, of, of the power it was supposed to bring and, and didn't see anything wrong with that. We had to sit down and say, man, I, I love you, man, but you, you don't understand. This is, this is so wrong. You know, and, and so it's so subtle because it seems good on the surface and harmless and everything like that, but the reality is, is that it's it's placing faith and power and looking to something other than God to meet the needs in our life. It's a, it's a counterfeit of God's power. You know, and this man was also a false prophet, which is interesting because the idea of a false prophet is they say things that seem good and godly. They sound spiritual. They, on the surface, they sound really good, but the truth is, is that they're not truth. You know, they're a version of truth at times, but it's a distorted version of truth. You know, and, and Saul says that you are deceiving people. You know, Saul also said that, that this man was perverting the right ways of the Lord, quote, unquote. Think about the phrase, perverting the right ways of the Lord. That word pervert in, 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 in the original language means to distort or twist something. And that's what he was doing. He was, he was taking things that sounded good and godly, and, 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 and he was twisting them and distorting them. And, and specifically, 
the things that were the right ways of the Lord, he was twisting those things. Thereby, giving people the, the rationale and the, the justification they needed to do the wrong thing. When we twist the, the, the right things in order to do the wrong things, that is not honoring to God. And we see that happen so much these days. You know, it says in those, you know, in Scripture it says in those days people will turn from truth. You know, and, and wanting to have their itchy ears satisfied, they will turn to false teachers who essentially tell them anything that they want to hear. And um, we see this in so many different ways. There, there are churches now that will change the right ways of God and distort it and twist it so that, they, that we can do the wrong thing. There are, you go on the internet and there's all kinds of different people tell you whatever you want to do is going to be okay. You can find somebody who can take scripture even and like a false prophet, twist it to where it sounds okay, and, 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 but, it, but it's twisting it and we got to be so, so careful about it. Because as we change the way we live, we also change our relationship to God inevitably at some point in there. You know, and, and so we're no longer submitting to God's lordship. Instead, he's just kind of along for the ride. And so we need to be careful of anybody that comes along and says, hey, I've got this new interpretation, the right way of interpretation. They didn't understand back then, and we haven't understood it right for a while. This is really what it means. We've got to be careful about that. You know, because the, the, my sense is that usually it's taking the right ways of the Lord and it's distorting them and twisting them for selfish motivations. So we need to be so, so careful about this. Well, well Elimus is, is standing in the way of Sergius, Paulus, um, the proconsul, the governor. He's standing in the way of him coming to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And so, so Saul, he's ticked, quite honestly. He says, this guy is frustrated. I'm trying to you know, save this person. He wants to know about the Lord. He's calling for us. He wants to hear, you know, the gospel. And this guy is giving him bad advice. And so he's bothered by that. You know, and um, so it says that Saul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked this sorcerer right in the eyes, and he called him a child of the devil, an enemy of everything that's right, and someone who's perverting the right ways of the Lord. You know, it's interesting. Um, Holy Spirit's referenced three times in this passage. 55 times in the book of Acts. And, um, and, and, and it's, it's really interesting how often when um, it says people were filled with the Holy Spirit, um, that the thing that went along with it, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they declared the wonders of God with boldness or they declared the word of God with boldness. You know, the Holy Spirit you know, comes on God's people not just to give us goose pimples when we worship, but also that we might declare the wonders and the word of God with greater boldness in a world where that word is not always welcome, it's not always received, and it's not always popular. It takes a level of boldness these days to still call sin, sin. It takes boldness to say that there's only one way to be saved, and that's to, through Jesus Christ. And we, we love these people of all these other religions, but at the same time, we don't love their religion. You know, because it's leading people astray. That is not popular, and, and, but there's still this need for boldness, and we don't need to be brash. We don't need to be abrasive. We don't need to be obnoxious. We don't need to be arrogant. But we do need to have a sense of boldness to say what needs to be said. You know, and, and um, so Saul tells Elimus that he's going to be blind for a while. And I, I don't, it's interesting. At first I thought, well, he's just ticked at this guy to say, yeah, I'm going to do this to you. You know, but the other side of it is, is that, that Saul was on his way to persecute the church on the road to Damascus. And what did, what did God do to him? He he said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And, 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 and he blinded Saul. And in the process, Saul's heart was softened, and, and, he, and there was repentance that took place. So maybe he's thinking, it worked for me. I was blinded. Maybe it'll work for Elimus. I don't know. But he says, you'll be blinded. You know, it took him out of the equation. You know, and God did exactly what Saul said God would do. And he blinds Elimus, which paved the way for Saul and Barnabas to talk to the governor about Jesus and and we know, you know, that, that from what we read here, that the governor, that Sergius, placed his faith in Jesus Christ. So, excuse me, so, so cool. You know, by the way, it's interesting, just a side note, in 1887, there was actually archaeological evidence that was found that supported um, that, that there really was a guy, Sergius um, Paulus, who was a governor in that area as well. So it's, it's really... Um, significant that this is somebody that we know 
from archaeological evidence really did exist and that the story that Luke is telling here, it's the real deal. So back to my point, though, is that I'm not saying that, that like Saul, we should go around calling people child of the devil. You child of the devil. We don't go around and say, hey, you're, God's going to blind you. I'm not encouraging that. But I do believe that, um, that just as Saul was, was bothered and, and just disturbed by this, this man who was leading people astray, all the while making it seem good on the surface, that should bother the people of God. That should not sit well with us. When, those, when people claim to be speaking on behalf of God or, or something, and, and they're, they're saying there's other ways to, to be saved and other than Jesus Christ, when they're, when they're watering down the truth of God's word to, you know, sin is no longer really sin and we see it differently now, then those things should bother us. We need to speak up. And whether there's change or people change or receptive or not, you never know. But at the same time, you know, there's too much at stake. Sheep are being led astray. You know, and, and so we need to be protective of that because there's so much at stake. You know, I, I love this passage. I think there's so much about it. And it gets me, I, I look at it, I get excited, you know, for our church. I think these are things we can do. We can pray. We can worship. We can, you know, we can fast. We can serve. We can... You know, some people, wow, we can speak the word of God, and, and we, we need to have a greater level of boldness as well. You know, we live in a culture where I get it. The world's not shy about its opinion. You know, and, and so we need, we need to use our voices as well and pray that God will give us wisdom and discernment about what to say and what not to say and how to say it. And so my prayer this morning, you know, is just if you join me in, in committing to be the, the people that God has called us to. You know, that, that we wouldn't have a, 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 a spirit of passivity, but maybe a spirit of participation in what God wants to do. Lord God, we come before you right now. We thank you for this. And there's a lot we've unpacked this morning, a lot of different ways we can go, but I believe that, that you're speaking in our lives. And, and so, Lord, help us to identify specifically, um, each of us, Lord, what you would have us do in response to your word this morning. We pray not just for this church, but for the church. Lord, um, that being said, we do pray specifically for this church as well, Lord, that we would be the people that you call us to be. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. God bless you and have a great day.